Often when I say to students, what story do you have to tell? Some students say to me, I don't know what story to tell. I don't have a story. And I say to them, the human being is a storehouse of stories. When we have to write, the material is always there. The material is there in our experience, in the experience of other people, and because most people in the world are not writers, but most people in the world have great stories, right? So use those stories. It's raw material. So where does fiction come from? I needed to describe this lawyer. I happen to have a friend of mine who is a Nigerian lawyer in the US. He's a huge, tall guy. And when I look at him, his fingers are huge. And he has a big ring. So I said, I'm not going to spend a minute thinking about how to describe this lawyer. I have a lawyer friend. So I use my lawyer friend's fingers to describe the lawyer in my book. So always, the stories are all over, all around us. If you have to describe a character in your novel, a novel you are doing, and you want to describe the character's features, physical features, mannerisms, and so on, and you're sitting in this very room, you have 28 or 29 or more raw materials to pick from. You can take her face and describe it, or his face, or mine. How does one become a writer? How does one become a writer? So I'm going to share my own experience, how I became a writer. I became a writer by telling a lie. So Chino Achebe, as I told you, invited me to the U.S. in 1988 to be the founding editor of an international magazine that they published. But when I went to America, the year that I started uh, Achebe's uh, magazine, African Commentary, as a founding editor, there were 584 new publications in America in 1989. And so very soon, our magazine died. So it's a way of saying, how I came to a point where the magazine that I had gone to America to set up had failed. And it came, became a moment of great distress for me because I had been a successful week, uh, editor of a weekly news magazine in Nigeria and Chino Achebe had called me out to America to set up a new international publication and I had risen to the challenge, but now it had collapsed. What saved my life were books. Now, this was something I encountered when I went to America. In Nigeria, when I lived in Nigeria, I'll go to a bookstore. If you open a book in a Nigerian bookstore and you linger over a page for two minutes, they'll tell you if you're not buying it, put it down. Okay? So I went to America to find that they will leave you chairs to sit and read. And the idea is that readers ultimately will buy. So one day I, was in, I came out of the bookstore and I ran into a man called John Edgar Wideman. He's actually one of my favorite African-American authors. And so John Wideman says to me, okay. Uh, so he said, now that the magazine has folded, what are your plans? I didn't have a plan yet. So I said to him, I don't know. And he looked me in the eye and he said to me, you must be writing a novel. The way he suggested that I was writing a novel, it was as if he was so sure that I felt if I said, no, I'm not writing a novel, this man will never talk to me ever again. So I said, yes, I'm writing a novel. <laughs> and he said, you know what? Send me bring me 15 to 20 pages of your manuscript 
and let's see if we can get you a fellowship to start studies for the MFA, Masters in Fiction, in Fine Arts, specializing in fiction at the University of Massachusetts, where he was a professor at the time. <coughs> I didn't know that the lie I had told or my rearrangement of the truth was gonna have, <laughs> was gonna have consequences. So, working feverishly with a particular fever and urgency over a long weekend, I was able to produce 23 pages of something. And I took it to his office. I made sure that I went when he was not likely to be there because I didn't want him to say, okay, let me look at what, while I stood there. So I went, he wasn't there, I put it in his mailbox and I ran away. Two days later, thank God that there was no caller ID at the time. You couldn't know who was calling you. My phone rang at home. There were no cell phones in America at the time. I picked up and he said, okay, this is John. That's John Weidman. And my heart started pounding. And he said, I read your manuscript, what you produced. And it's really fascinating. And he said it reminded him of the writing of Ngugi Wathiyanga. So he said to me, I think we can get you into the MFA program. And that's how I started studying fiction. The moral of the story is that often we have through what I might call a process of osmosis, through a process of, in, you know, of um, ineffable, ineffable transmission. We master from reading itself, from immersing ourselves in the creative work text. We already master the techniques for putting something together, but we don't know it. The point that I was making is that in all my readings, in all the years of reading, I had already begun to um, get through a process of osmosis, right? When you immerse yourself in something, you are transformed by it, right? Right? So, but I didn't know this. It was like I was already swimming in the environment of fiction.